Okay, well, I want to welcome uh, very warmly uh, Mr. Dexter Dalwood, uh, excellent painter, uh, which uh, he has now an exhibit in the Museo Nacional de Arte Mumel in Mexico, and uh, uh, Nick Cerota, which is an incredible person and very well known person in the in the art world, and uh, it's a honor for me to to be here with you too. Um, I am in Mexico. You two are in in Great Britain. And uh, we are uh, going to have a conversation about uh, about uh, the, the work of uh, Dexter Dalwood in the Munal. I have to thank you very, very warmly uh, to Carmen Gaitan, which uh, she invited me to participate in this in this uh, in this talking, and uh, and Leticia Carpizo, which is uh, she makes possible a lot, a lot of things that uh, uh, that uh, makes this uh, kind of things happen. Uh, as a member of the, the Consejo, uh, I am uh, very, very proud to be here. And uh, I want to talk about uh, the, the exhibition of Dexter in Mexico now. Uh, the name is uh, Esto no me pertenece. It doesn't belong to me. Uh, also, it's very important in the sense of uh, looking from some other some other points, some other sites. And the, the interior looking also, not, not only the, the highlights of the history, it's also a, a very important looking about the insights of that, that history. And uh, I should like to, to begin talking, and I think this is the main point of the conversation, maybe uh, just about painting, about, about uh, how you go through the Dexter in, 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 your, in your personal work and how you uh, approach to this kind of situations, uh, uh, moments of the history of, of many countries, all the work you did in LA, it's incredible. The work you're, you are doing in Mexico, it's incredible also. And, uh, but for many, for many points, you have been putting your eye in those moments in translating it with painting. Can you talk us about a little bit about that? Um, sure, yes, thank you. And uh, very nice to be here, um, Santiago, uh, talking to you from London. Um, I think just briefly, perhaps to outline that, I mean, my fascination really from, I'd say, from the early 2000s has been um, trying to think of a way of making a contemporary version of the genre of history painting. So I kind of felt slightly fell into that in a way, because I started making these fictional space paintings of fictional spaces of often um, famous events or even portraits of people without the people in. And then it, I kind of came around to thinking these were sort of history painting. And I started, when I started to think of that as a way of actually taking it seriously and thinking about it, I also thought a lot about 18th century history painting, which obviously had a huge, um, in terms of European painting, it was an incredibly um, important genre and for um, a long time it was the pinnacle of uh, a painter's accomplishment is to attempt history painting. So, so I think that that approach has uh, changed over a period of time because now we're talking you know these paintings I've been making since uh, the Mexican paintings have been really from 2017 till now. Um, uh, that when I had a, when I visited Mexico um, that it was, it was really the overwhelming idea of thinking, well, perhaps I could have a go at looking and thinking about how to start making some paintings relating to one particular subject as an overall idea rather than individual events um, in terms of how I've alighted on things before. So, and I think that it, the kind of the, the exhibition or the idea of the exhibition really came from um, looking at a particular mural by um, Siqueiros, which is in, um, in the, on the university campus in Unam. And it was the list of dates, 1520, 1810, 1857, 1910, 19 question mark, question mark, which got me thinking around <coughs> just the idea of uh, dates as markers within history. So 
So that's one side. And then at the same time, my approach to thinking about making paintings is to just really research and look at the existing images alone. So it's not so much more of the idea of looking at the reading up enormous amounts of history. It's about actually looking at what are the images which represent these, this period or this period of time or around this period. And then trying to think, sort of brainstorming away from the illustrative obvious into something which hopefully is a, is a reconstruction of some of those actual existing images, but then me bringing in my idea of what I think might be an interesting painting for a 21st century audience. So Dexter, when you're talking about history painting, yeah. I mean, obviously you have a fascination with history and you've said yourself just now that you don't see this as being simply a kind of historical reconstruction. But is the subject that you choose in some way also related to the present? When I think back to sort of the history painting of the late 18th century in France, you think of David, you think of great compositions like the Oath of the Harati, yeah. and he was using history to talk about the present as well as to talk about the past. Is that also part of your intent or are you principally concerned with trying to evoke with a number of fragmented images what it is that was important about you know, a given moment? I think it's important to think, I mean, I know it, it so, okay. I think it's important that they become contemporary images which relate to a particular moment and the moment being now. And that idea of how that can possibly make one rethink the past, I think. So, I mean, like when you say, they're not allegories, I'm not really interested in allegories and they're not, you know, then it's, it's history painting when it goes into contemporary dress. <laughs> you know, when you think of, um, you know, the, the idea of, of how the genre changed. And I've thought a lot about, you know, the 20th century version of that as well. I'm thinking of artists who've tried and uh, attempted to have a go at that, even through photography, like Jeff Wall, for example, or through an artist like Richard Hamilton, I think British artist, or, or even, you know, Jörg Immendorf as well in um, Berlin, with this idea of how to actually make paintings which are actually very, very contemporary in their nature and why they're paintings now, but also that it relates to thinking about the experience of history through the present, but also the relating it to history painting in the way that there are embedded references within the painting. I think that's the big connection with historically with history painting, that and in a way that's the, that's the way one could frame what a history painting is, is history painting has in itself embedded references. And I think that's something which was obviously understood by an 18th century audience very clearly. And then a lot of that has evaporated when we look at those paintings of the past. But for me, for the viewer now, it's this idea that it's not that they get every single reference I put into a painting, but somehow there's things which are there for a particular reason, which kind of hopefully un, sort of unveil themselves as you negotiate it. Well, in, in some point I feel that uh... Most of the work you're presenting now in Mexico, it's uh, out of uh, these uh, very small pics, but very powerful pics about, uh, about the history. I mean, when you're talking about to talk to the people of the 21st century and, and, and how to put them in front of that uh, big history, uh, how, can, how can we take away from that big history the key moments, the, 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 the moments that uh, are more important for you to, to uh, make more important, to give them more relevance in, 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 in your work. Uh, for example, when you put uh, this uh, rifles taken about the, the Monet painting in the, in the kingdom of Maximiliano, and you just put the rifles with the, with the smoke and the, the things. I think that's the point. It's not Maximiliano, are not the soldiers. It's not the environment. 
is the shot is the is the point that uh, that shot how came to change the history in 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 that moment how ends an empire and begins the the the, the, the government of uh, Juarez and uh, I, I mean the the point is not how they could take Maximiliano and put him put him there uh, it's not how Maximiliano came back to Austria no, no. The, the point is how the, that shot was a, a groundbreaking point in the in, in the history it's one before and after after that shot yeah I mean yes I think that that's that is all true but I think also I think within even within the title of the exhibition which I think is incredibly important as to know that that it's it's I'm looking at it really through painting eyes so for me for example why I decided to make that small version from that Manet painting which is an edited version of it because is that I was fascinated with the artist how Manet basically encountered that story the the when it broke the story that Maximilian had been executed that he made a painting very quickly where everyone's uh, the emperor's wearing Maximilian's wearing sombrero Yes. And then when the news reports came in later, they turned out, of course, they weren't, but really, just because he was thinking, well, they're Mexican, they must be wearing sombreros, kind of thing. And then later on, he makes the painting, which is the one in the, the fragmented painting in the National Gallery in London, which is that it's much more a, an eyewitness report of how they actually looked. And I'm interested in, for me, that's everything in terms of that the, I'm interested in Manet's relationship to the way he painted and then deciding to paint about this particular event, which obviously is a very, very political event, but also, I suppose, within the, the idea of putting that painting back into Mexico in the way that I did, rather than it being in, a, in Europe or being in London, is this that and making it a very small painting, deliberately to be hung on a very, very large wall of this museum, which is the Museum of, um, you know, it's, it's the National Museum of Mexican Art, is to say that this very this actually this one moment which is incredibly significant is being is that's the point of it is it's like it's almost like a postage stamp size painting to say about the epic moment of that trigger being pulled but it's it's as i say it's kind of complicated in the way i've come around to why i think that's interesting because it's also very much to do with the history of the the actual event and then the painted version of that event, which already exists. Um, I think Santiago, you, you, you focus on a very interesting example of the way in which uh, Dexter does focus on these really critical elements of a particular story or interior or moment. And that's something that you've always done Dexter, isn't it? You've always used these fragments and pushed together fragments in the form of, often in the form of a collage, really. But each of the elements within the painting is itself, well, it's self-sufficient on one level, but it also, by being in juxtaposition with other fragments in a collage, it then gains additional meaning and additional layers are really created. Why, why, is collage, why is collage so interesting to you as a, as a, as a technique? Um, I think it's this, the surprise element and also it's a thing, also it's a thing to do with scale in relationship to figurative painting. I think that's very important. It's the idea of how to break away from, if you like, the Renaissance window. <laughs> The whole problem of you know figuration in a way is the foreground, middle ground, background problem of what you do, and given you know what painting has done in the last 150 years, to think about well how do you not somehow recreate a um, uh, you know, an old-fashioned if you like way of a retro way of making a um, space so collage you know obviously as a sort of modernist tool was just it, it liberated that but also i find that 
by somehow separating out things. I haven't created, as I say, an environment, but I'm creating an idea of things across the picture plane. It's a way also of being able to use color in a very, very direct way physically, because it's the idea of how you can get the color to balance against these elements across the surface, which then becomes something which on first glance is kind of readable. And then second glance, you think, well, it doesn't really make sense, but then its sense is how it's constructed. It's almost like the grammar, I suppose what I'm fascinated in is the, the grammar of the painting. And they have moved from, you know, kind of reconstructing of actual spaces, which are in some of the paintings where interiors and into this idea that almost they are figmental in a way. And I'm thinking of like, for example, the painting in the show, the 1968 painting, yep. which I wanted to do something about uh, that moment, you know, the, the, the uh, Tateleco when these students were basically shot down during the Mexico 68 Olympics. And, and it's often this thing of trying to sort of brainstorm away from the obvious that I, I didn't want to particularly I didn't want to depict the actual place. I didn't want to depict dead students from, you know, in, from 60s photographs. It's just this thing of how can you create a kind of moment which somehow something sort of warped then. And I suppose that then it was to do with thinking, just looking at the 68 Olympic graphics actually, which were, you know, very, very distinctive. And that also because the graphics are so distinctively late 60s as well, they actually look like something from that period. And then how to sort of just take that idea of the graphic and then kind of distort it like it's sort of literally crushing something is how I came up with the idea that that thing could crush the idea of these recumbent figures, but the recumbent figures are from a mixed text codis, which is from, you know, um, 500 years ago. So in a sense of that, just how to mix that up in a way, which in the, in the, in the hope that it settled into, oh yeah, that is possibly it. And I was very surprised that I showed that painting to a couple of people in Mexico long before the exhibition. They said to me without saying anything to them, they said, is that, is that 68, you know? So that whole thing that, that, what I hoped it would evoke, sort of evoked, seemed to evoke something just in a kind of muscle, a sort of image memory somewhere that you just think you think about that. But I think, and I struggle with that painting. I mean, a long, I mean, if you look at it, there's a kind of shadow of Mexico 68 underneath it in type. And I changed the color three or four times. And so it's just that thing, how these things settle and suddenly think, okay, yes, I think that is, possibly emblematic enough to represent what I thought I thought I was thinking about. <laughs> yeah. So I suppose that's, as you say, that's how the collage element now is, because I've used it so long, is a kind of natural tool of putting things together. And it just, it's, it, I'm at ease with it in a way that the sort of cut and paste con construction of collage, I think I was doing 20 years ago has, has moved on to a completely different uh, thing. Well, yes, in the case of the 1968 painting, it's, uh, it's very powerful how the aesthetics, the colors, the, the forms, yeah. there are some curves, they're crushing down a group of persons, a group of students in this case. Uh, it's very, very interesting because all that, uh, the, the, the power of that uh, pop culture, well, well, not pop, maybe post pop, uh, all the aesthetics of that moment in the 68, it's very clear, it's very powerful, it's very uh, representative of the, the 60s in, in Mexico. There, we are, there are paintings like uh, Arnaldo Cohen, like uh, Kazuya Sakai, like uh, many more that were doing that kind of work. And then when this kind of uh, inverted wave goes through the, through, through the bottom and pushes down the, the, the three bodies, it's uh, is, is really powerful. And the very silent word, the numbers of 1968, it's, uh, there's like a, like a presence which is very terrifying at the same time. It, it is beautiful. It, it has both, uh, both parts. Dexter, you mentioned that 
originally in that painting, the words Mexico appeared. Is that often the case that you start with a, a canvas that may have quite a few images on it and some of them just become painted out and obliterated? I mean, it looks as though in one or two of other paintings, you've put a layer of paint over previous images. Yes. Is that yes. something you do quite often? Do you slowly, slowly in a way distill the subject? I do now, yeah, I do now. I mean, I think, you know, earlier on I used to make collages of templates for the paintings and start from there. Now, now I don't really do that. I start, I tend to start off with something and then find an element sometimes I want to include, but would paint it rather than construct a full collage before. Because I want it to happen across the surface again. It's a whole, you know, it's like a painting thing of having that experience of making decisions for the painting rather than making decisions for the, the idea sketch slash template collage towards the painting. So, and I think that what that has done is that thing of, you know, I think the hardest thing about painting is to know when it's finished. And I think that's something which you get, you know, it comes with age in a way. You get better and better at thinking the energy of the painting, you go in every day and, make, and then suddenly one day you don't do something, the next day and suddenly a week's gone past you done, and you realise actually the painting's come to an end rather than this idea that you finish it. And I think that's that, it's the settling process, uh, which I'm kind of much more interested in now as well. And so I suppose, yeah, that, that it's like the very large blue painting with the marching feet, the inadequate um, painting history of Mexico. And that started off as a complete grid so the grid of the grid of where the feet are that was right across the surface and I because I wanted it to be a painting which was going to be like the magnum opus which would represent the whole the whole of oh, history and time yeah 500 years or something <laughs> so it had a comet on the right hand side and it had Cortez up on the left and I had a I had even had one of the figures from Manet it was an absolute disaster you know so it took a long time to get the whole thing to sort of move around a bit like a sort of chessboard or something and moving some of these elements like Cortez came from the top left hand corner to the bottom right and and even that little bit of the heel on the on the far left hand side of the paint is actually what came in in the last element finally made the thing settle and the space hold what I hoped it would hold but the painting doesn't look anything like I imagined it would when I began it and I think in a way as the you know being you know, in the studio, that's kind of what you, that's the exciting thing, really. I mean, it's incredibly frustrating, upsetting and hard, but, in, but it's the exciting thing about um, finding a way of working, which is you, that you're sort of looking for what you don't quite know, but when you see it, you, it settles it down. That's why, but at the same time, there's this overriding idea of what the thing is, what the subject is and what you're hoping. And, and then this has obviously been an umbrella idea across a lot of work so it's not just one work it's how that work could coexist with these other works and that how that could extend the idea of the mm. possibility of the exhibition as well so just just coming back um you were talking about adding that final touch to the painting by putting in the heel yeah um and it is very striking i think in your paintings this this tension between the aesthetic and the subject, you know, you're playing with you're playing with both really at, at all times. If you look at the um, the eighteen ten painting, for instance, um, with the extraordinary um, image of the actually, if you hear some background noise, it's because there's hail is hitting the windows. But um, that's life. I just said. It's, it's suddenly dark and there's hail. Yeah. Anyway, if you if, if you look at that painting, the 1810 painting, I mean, it's an extraordinary piece of painting as such, I think, because there are so many different kinds of surfaces in it. And that seems to be one of the things that fascinates you as to how to how to apply the paint to the canvas and what what you're conveying with that paint. So if you look at the, the earth that these figures are walk, marching across has a very, very different quality from the sky or whatever. Or well, there's a section of that sky which is almost like a dacuni, yeah. the way the paint yeah. is brushed on. Oh, yeah, absolutely, deliberately. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So I suppose my question is, you know, 
to what extent is that whole painterly exercise a very important part of your practice? I think it's a very important part because I think, um, you know, it's still, it's that idea of approaching the surface, which is a different experience from seeing the thing from a distance, a bit like the whole problem with seeing a JPEG compared to the experience of standing in, some, in front of something. So, and I'm very interested in that, that, you know, that an image from a distance can look concrete in the way that a Cezanne from across the room can look concrete. And as you walk towards it, it just dissolves into paint. <laughs> and, and I also think that there should be a slight aesthetic shock sometimes to think, oh, what that against that? Like is, you know, that I, I like that myself when I'm seeing other work. So, and I think also to occasionally reference you know, the idea of painting space. So I think, you know, because I'm the idea of using, for example, like the Liechtenstein in the Bende dot screen spray thing is it seems that it's another tool to create a, a shallow space, which isn't quite on the surface. It's almost like two centimeters below somehow. And it kind of does this thing which hovers a bit like the idea of, you know, all the, you know, post Warhol, everything is, just sort of possibly five centimeters deep. There's nothing else, there's no beyond, there's no vista. And then though, to mix it up with um, the idea, you know, the idea of something doing, that I want to convey the idea, this is the back of something, for example. And then I think in that painting, it took a long time for it to actually again to work because it's only when I put the drop shadow in that it suddenly, it did something, it came out from the surface of the painting rather than just sitting flat on the surface of the painting. Mm -hmm. So then that idea creates a kind of tension. And then the whole thing is a bit like a crucifix anyway. And you know, obviously all artists desperately want to paint their own crucifix <laughs> at some point. And what was interesting for me, I was thinking about it and it, in just in making it, I started to think about this Goya painting, which I remembered seeing years ago, which is called Burial of the Sardine, which is this painting with the banner in. And, and then what was amazing for me to read, suddenly reading about that, because I used the top of that for the banner, but also reading about the painting, that painting actually was da is dated around 1810. Mm -hmm. And that, so for me, those sort of things, I did, you know, the idea where kind of real history and moments history and art history kind of hit, I, I really, I love that kind of thing. I mean, it's a kind of nerdy aspect to it, but I do really enjoy that kind of like the idea that he's making this painting in Spain, this, but this painting about Hidalgo in Mexico is the break from Spain. And then also there's a kind of, there's a hidden agenda in the Goya painting. These ideas, people are celebrating the, the burial of the old and the possibility of the new. And it's just, it's an interesting, you know, those kind of things, those kind of, which aren't obviously, I don't expect the, re the viewer to get all that, but for me, that's what charges and keeps me going with the energy and the excitement of, you know, how to think about make, constructing these images, I suppose. Yeah, so you, I mentioned, know. you mentioned Goya. I mean, you, 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 you spend, you're, to an unusual degree, you're aware of the language of other artists. And you've often used the language of other artists. I mean, you talked a moment ago about Liechtenstein's Bende dots and so on. Yeah. But this is an unusual exhibition because you've brought the work of other artists into the show. Yeah. How did you come to select those artists and for what purpose? Well, this was, uh, was when the show was first um, talked about and um, uh, Carmen was in interested in the possibility of doing the show. The show, we were talking about how it would how it would sit within the museum. And I think with the 19th century creator at that time, Victor Rodriguez, who unfortunately passed away, um, was talking about the possibility of what might be included given the images that he'd already seen. And so very quickly, the um, Rivera painter painting the, um, Zapatista landscape um, was one which he bought, but also one I was a painting which I already knew very, very well, and I was very keen to have it. Although, you know, I think it's a it's a masterpiece, you know, the, to include that. And then he actually suggested the Francisco Goiter, mm. 
which I was also very interested in because I'd seen that painting in Munau when I visited Mexico first, and I didn't really know much about Goethe, and I'd read up more about him, and then I liked the idea of including that particularly because like Goya, he was one of the only you know, the artists of that period who'd actually been in the revolution and then actually witnessed this stuff firsthand. So that painting is particularly from, you know, things he'd actually seen. So I'm, I was very keen to have that in the show. And then the Jose Maria Velasco, the three paintings which are on the wall of the 1910, is an artist I knew very little about. I didn't really know anything about him before I came to Mexico. And um, I'd seen his paintings in Munal in 2017, but I didn't really know him. And I became more and more interested in the idea of this sort of realist painter, but somehow again, there's something very peculiar um, about, there's a sort of the hidden things within the paintings. And the two paintings that I included, which is one of the, um, the Pyramid of the Sun and the other one of the, the San, Raf I think it's San Rafael, or I can't remember the title, but, but what San, I like about- San Angel, yeah. the San Angel page, San Angel. Yes, San Angel, yeah. Yeah. What I liked about the, the, the juxtaposition of the two was one was a kind of painting of archaeology in a way, you know, mm. the, this painting, this thing which, which was you know, which was to do with the part, the distance, distant past, and particularly then I think the relationship of the 19th century to that past. And then the other one included a factory with a smoking chimney, which made me think then think of Surat and the idea of the landscape, which is suddenly has elements of industrialization coming in. So then, right. and that made me, you know, I got very excited about the idea of, you know, that this is a 19th century painter who's also aware of the, obviously very aware of the time they're in, but also there's a kind of, there's a, almost a kind of coded stuff going on within the work. And then I, so for that, to include those on that wall with the 1910, with the, the book all distributed across the wall as an installation and the whole painting for me, wasn't so much about the idea of it being the revolution of the day, it was to do with the end of, you know, Porfirio Diaz's regime, but also the end of the 19th century, but also I'm kind of saying the end of the 19th century in terms of taste and aesthetic, in terms of landscape painting as well, in a way. I mean, you know, again, it's like, in, you know, in terms of how I'm thinking about it. And then in the, again, back in the other room, I think the, the um, painting by Orozco, no, um, Nacion Viquiene, which is small nation opposite the painting of the constitution, seemed to be just a very interesting juxtaposition. And I, I obviously I, I've seen a Roscoe before, but I hadn't seen that painting until I, I looked into what was in Munau in, in, in storage. And then, and then the Petronola Monroy, the little one of the constitution, we just wanted that in in a way, as a signifier for the date, because the, as I said, to do with this idea of 1810, 1857, 1910, and that was that particular moment. Mm. Now that you're talking about uh, the 1810 uh, painting, <clears throat> I feel a, a very, very important point in, in, your, in your eyes, in your view, is uh, the way you situate the viewer. The, the person that is going to look at your painting. And it reminded me the Bronco painting with the O.J. Simpson in the Bronco running away. Yeah. And uh, you put the passenger in the car. And now in the 1810 painting, you put the person behind the, the Virgin of Guadalupe. Mm -hmm. Like if it will be running to this big uh, uh, demonstration of liberty. And so I, I feel very important the way you think in the viewer. You're, you're not only asking the viewer to, to sit in front of your, your paintings and to watch them. You put the, the, the viewer in the scene. You put the viewer inside the things you are looking to, which is, I think, is very, it's, it's very, very particular way you, you approach to the, to the visual scenario you have in front. No, I think it's yeah. I think that's it's something I've yeah you know, wanted to do for a while. I think just think because it's it's that thing of always thinking 
you know, what is the experience of someone else looking at it, not just me? Do you know what I mean? And what I, what I want to do. And then, as I say that thing before about the advantage of collage is you can, you can make scale work in a very different way. Because if you don't have a figure which creates a, a human scale, then yeah. things can become very, very, you can become like the height of a child entering a space, for example, because everything becomes much, much larger and you're coming from a different level. Or things are much, much bigger, much, much smaller, but then that's doing something physically to you when you're looking at it, you know what I mean? Because you're having to reduce, to think into the space of it. And so I think that, as you say, I mean, I was very conscious of that, with that painting, the O.J. Simpson painting, then is of, of the idea of a witness, a witness, sure. Not the protagonist, but the witness next to it. And I suppose that kind of voyeuristic thing as well, I'm kind of interested in, in terms of where you are. You know, it's a bit like with Hitchcock or something. Where are you, the viewer, in relationship to what's happening as the camera moves or as you're looking at a painting? Okay, so, I mean, in terms of talking about bringing yourself into the painting, with the 1910 painting, the... Um, the moment of revolution and then you extend that painting out across the whole wall so standing in front of it which of course I can't do but I can imagine you're very much in the painting itself you're in the environment you're in the installation is that something you've done before no no this is that's an absolute um a new thing which is from doing this exhibition and also you know because the exhibition also is um you know a collaboration with this other curator, Francisco Bazunza. So he, you know, he talked about the vision of the show as well. And it, it's, mm -hmm. so we kind of came to an idea around the idea of what, what about extending the book, the pages off the painting. And I think, and I, I cause I was sort of thinking, I don't, I haven't redone really that before. And I thought, well, I suddenly thought actually it would be an amazing thing to do. And that's how it came around. And then thinking of hanging the paintings on top of the other paintings on top of that. So the whole thing becomes an environment uh, so that, that was in, and also the wall drawing on behind the 1519 painting was something which I'd made small drawings consistently, you know, towards this exhibition. And then I remember showing them, I think, I think that he'd seen some of those. And he said, why don't you make that drawing or one of these drawings very, very large on the wall? And I think and it's that whole idea of a kind of collaboration. I think, well, I don't really do that. And I think actually, that would be an incredibly interesting thing to do because also very much again the idea of using scale yeah. that those drawings are from the next text codices which are often mm -hmm. you know this size you know, very small it's much smaller than a4 and the idea of making this drawing very very big in the idea that the subject is this idea of what's already there in mexico when we have the idea of the 1519 painting being this insertion that something this is like the arrival of the conquest so you know i think that 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 created a different thing with scale in the way that the the manet painting being very small created a very different thing with scale to rethink the idea of that and then the possibility of i think drawing coexisting with painting i, I am you know with the next show i'm also interested in doing extended wall drawing and need and seeing how that works on a much longer wall. But it is a new thing, yeah. And, and in this sense, uh, what you said, uh, you're creating an environment. Uh, I, 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 have, I want to put the eyes in the book you choose. It's the Illustrated History of Mexico, which uh, suddenly it becomes from a book that you can have in your hands. And suddenly this book is placed in a very big world in a very big way. And so the book is there. You cannot have it in your hands, but the book is there. And the imagines of that, uh, what the, the, the title of the book says, uh, I illustrated a uh, Mexican history, uh, is, is in front of you, as talking to you in this very, very big environment with the numbers 1910, which is a very, is very, very powerful. And in the sense of the, of the drawing you made in your room, uh, uh, the, the, the key points of that drawing are very, very simple and very uh, silent elements that give a lot of information about uh, what you're trying to, to, to share 
with the viewer. I, I think they, they choose Judith about those, uh, those kind of drawings and those, those kind of lines. It's very powerful in the sense of that creating that environment. And if this paint is a large painting, it goes bigger when you see in, in the next wall, this very tiny painting of the shot of Maximiliano, which is, yeah. uh, I think it's a very, very good choice. And the shot goes to the pre-Hispanic drawing you did. Yeah. 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 And also just to mention, I think, um, I think the Rivera painting, I think is very key in the show, not just because of the subject matter, but again, in where I was talking about man, I'm very interested in the idea of the artists. So the idea of Rivera being in Paris, possibly inventing Cubism, <laughs> you know, but be, making Cubist paintings. And then, but still, even though being very, very interested in this idea of Cubism, the, the subject matter is still Mexico. Yes. But then when he comes back to Mexico, he makes a, a, an absolute, you know, a conceptual decision about his work, not to, not to paint like that any longer, but to find a way, find a new way to represent the figure, particularly, which relates to you know, pre-Columbian art and everything, which would then possibly represent this idea of Mexico itself. And I think that's, for me, that those points when artists make decisions about, I'm no longer gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. And that's a genuine you know, severance of the thing before, I think is fascinating. I think, I think that's, that seems to be like that whole thing of thinking through and the idea of style. You know, people talk so much about style, but the idea that there, there is no generic style that anyone has, it's just a choice, you know, in the sense you choose what to, how to yeah. represent what you want to represent. So that, for me, I think that's, you know, it's a great painting. It's, you know, I was frightened to have it within my show because, you know, <laughs> to go up against the best, one of the best Rivera paintings was a, a tall order, but I was delighted to have it. And I think in the juxtaposition with the 1519 and the 68, somehow it just, it seems to make a sense. And, and also, again, the fragmented collage element of the painting, which is so interesting and the folded empty piece of paper in the right hand corner, which almost invites this so what next element to it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And yeah, that's one of the very, very, very important paintings of Rivera. It's an incredible painting. And yes, you're right. After that, um, in, in Paris, when he came back to Mexico, he didn't do that anymore. I mean, uh, it, it's a very dated painting. It's a very, very dated painting. Yeah, yeah. Well, talking of dates, precision and dates, Talk a little bit about the 1994 painting. You know, this idea that he kind of led the Zapatista movement in Chiapas and standing up for indigenous land rights. And, and that, again, for me, it was really, the, again, I didn't know much about him. I, I only knew him through uh, John Berger and the discussion, these letters which were exchanged between, these very beautiful letters which were exchanged between the two of them. But I didn't really, I didn't realize the phenomena that had happened in the mid nineties in Mexico. So this is from you know, talking to people about it and this idea that he, several people told me he had just appeared suddenly on TV screens, like it was coming from a different, completely different reality. Mm. So, and then, so I just thought about the idea of that, you know, having a go at, and also there are no, there are no paintings of Marcos. You know, so I thought that was interesting as well, the idea that something which is very well known, there isn't any representation as far as I could see anyway. Mm. Um, but then I set it in a kind of 1990s interior deliberately. And also in some ways it's much more like my earlier work, which was I was making in the late 1990s and it becomes like a room again. So it's a kind of retro, it's a kind of play on a retro self thing as well in terms of time, but that was back then. And that, so I kind of try to evoke this idea of a sort of, um, it's like based on Monica's room in Friends with this lilac background, mm. but also it being a bit pop and edgy and also slightly uncomfortable in the, the idea of the environment of this thing being positioned in this thing, which isn't about this, this interior at all. It's about actually what's coming through 
what he's actually saying on the television. So um, I thought that was a very interesting, and actually while I was in Mexico, I've also made a painting which is has him in again, but I set it in Chiapas itself as the idea of possibly him seeing himself on television, which might go into the next, make might go into the next exhibition. Conjured up in my mind a resonance of this Richard Hamilton print of Kent State, which was an image that he took from a TV screen yes. of the the occurrence in Kent State in Kent State in 1972 when he was I think he was in I think he was in a hotel room in Munich and he saw this image on the screen and then he recorded it. It made me feel again this was a, a different kind of history painting really. A different approach to history painting from some of the paintings, other paintings in, in the exhibition. Yes, yeah, I think that's very true. Yeah. yeah. I think that, I mean, I, I've i also written about history painting. I mean, I did, a, I wrote this chapter in this um, the book about, which was a collection of essay, a book uh, about the idea of history painting. I wrote about, um, you know what is it? What is how, what is a contemporary? What is the contemporary in contemporary history painting? And I wrote about actually Rita Donner's painting, Richard mm -hmm. Hamilton's painting, and Jorg Immendorf. And I, I think very interesting. I mean, I know this is not necessarily known. For, Rita Donner's not very known within Mexico, but I think she's a very interesting histo history painter in a very different way because she uses abstraction in a way which also has incredible embedded images within it, but also is very specific about its subject and what it alights on. And the painting that 10 days in May, 1971, which is one in, um, I wrote about actually, that it has this idea of this, 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 this thing that she did with the students, it was to do with the locking, but it was also to do with Kent State. And it was this thing to do with the idea of the local and the idea of things happen internationally, and yet the whole painting is an abstract painting. And I think that for me, that, that coding an idea that you could potentially have an enormous agenda, but again, it's not a question of illustrating that, it's a question of how that informs the decisions you make to make something which hopefully has sort of coexists, these elements coexist together to make a whole, which is a new, it's a new thing completely. So you're having to encounter it and then maybe the title nudges you towards a different understanding of it, or maybe the title you know, sends you somewhere else in terms of then that reference then from then on, when you hear that being spoken about, then that, that image then comes into your head, which I'm also think is very interesting, like the idea of saying, like you say, Kent State. So when one hears it, you can suddenly think of that Richard Hamilton painting or, <laughs> You know that I like the I like the idea that images can replace other images because they just a made up fiction, and I suppose that's the whole thing I'm interested in, and also the complete subjectivity of history itself and painted history, and how that is as we're witnessing shifting mm. continually, and that the only thing which is kind of particularly definitive about history are that there are fixed moments which we can agree on, which, you know, that gunshot was fired on that day, this happened on that day, but everything around it is continually up for reappraisal and um, rethinking. And I think that's what's so exciting about it. And I think that, you know, my, this exhibition is no, you know, it is no more, I'm sure, I'm sure in 20 years time, it'll look very much like a paint, uh, a show made in the early 20th century. It's not, it's how, it's how those things, you know, nothing, beco nothing becomes timeless. Everything is somehow connected to where it's, when it's made and constructed. And it's how that, how that residue, how you see that from the distance is the thing which is so fascinating about, um, change and how we negotiate the things which already exist. That, that's right. I just said something key is not illustration, it's information. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that's, that's a key point. Yeah. yeah. Santiago, the, the, the title of this show, you know, this doesn't belong to me, tells you, of course, that uh, Dexter is aware that this is not his, 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 not his, his history at all. It's the history of Mexico. I just wonder how, how has the exhibition been received by people in Mexico? 
in but terms of a, a, a British artist talking about their history. Well, look, he's very clear in the title. This doesn't belongs to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I am just like a kind of a witness. and uh, yeah. But uh, a witness that makes a very, very, very important lecture about uh, the things that have been happening around. It. And uh, when you say it doesn't belong to me, it, it has a sense of respect also. It has a sense of, uh, I'm going to look this, I'm going to tell you this, but I want to respect what uh, has been happening here. But at the same time, when you take it in your hands and you put it in the walls, it belongs to you. It belongs to you like a, like a citizen of the world, like a citizen of any person that can go anywhere and, uh, and take a look of what is uh, the history of that place or where it's going in, in the moment and in, in the one he's there. And, and yes. at that point, I think uh, the, the work of, uh, of Dexter is, uh, it's very important in, in the sense to touch the, the, the public, the Mexican public, mm -hmm. saying the public, this doesn't belong to me, but this is what I think. And, and uh, he's, he's not away from the history. He's part of the history in a very respectful way. And I think the title is very, very important in this case because uh, it puts you in front of a person that is sharing with you a lecture of what he thinks is going on in history. You know? Uh, in, in this point, in, in Mexico, maybe you are aware of this, uh, we're having a lot of changes uh, in terms of uh, how can we read the story or, or how uh, we need to read the, the, the history. Uh, for example, the, the Columbus statue was uh, pulled down because yeah. uh, it, it was not a very welcome in, in the moment of this, uh, this kind of a government. Uh, and so they took it away and they are going to, it's going to be substituted for a, another piece that maybe it's going to be an indigenous person or a, a whatever. But uh, they, they want to rename, they want to, to uh, reorient the, the, the history from the symbols, not from, from what really happened, because what happened is there, it's a fact, you cannot change it. But they wanted to change it by the symbols. Simple, the, the tree of the sad night in, in Popotla, which is uh, where Alvarado was crying after his, uh, he lost the battle against the Las Caltecas. And uh, I think it was Las Caltecas, I'm sorry for, for my not precision information. Uh, now that the name is different, is the name, the, the, the tree is not called it anymore. The, the sad night tree now is the victorious night tree. And, and then the tree is the same one. The facts are the same one. It's only to, to rename the, 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 the things that have been, is, is, uh, make, they have been assembled for to reorient the lecture of the history. In, in any way, as uh, Dr. Edmundo Gorman said a lot of times, uh, we are what we have been. Somos lo que hemos sido in, in, in Spanish, uh, which uh, we, we cannot change that part. Maybe we can agree with some points or, or, or not, or, or we, no, no, not to agree with them, but that, that, had, that happened. That was there. That was uh, uh, part of what, what, what we are now. Uh, of course, it's a very complex mixture of, uh, of uh, a history about uh, the, the, where we coming from, from Spain, the indigenous, uh, but uh, there's a lot of people that is white, where it's very Mexican. Uh, and I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a real mixture, but that makes us to be what we are now with all our contradictions and with all our, uh, our uh, encountering points. It's a, it's a very complex mass of things that, uh, that uh, make Mexico what it is. Well, I think it's these contradictions in history which are so interesting. I mean, we have similar questions being raised in England where, unfortunately, some people are trying to make history more simple than it really is. It's actually very complex. And actually what one wants to do is to show as many different sides of a story as you possibly can show. That's one of the things that, again, is interesting about Dexter's paintings. Somehow, you know, you have these fragments which 
make part of the story, but then as a viewer, you have to come in and fill in the rest of the story and take from the painting something that is your meaning or your understanding or your reading of a, of a condition. That's I mean, right. I've, I've, lear I've learned a lot about Mexican history in the last few days, looking at these paintings. <laughs> uh, and I feel better for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have a much, much greater understanding. And, and Nick, uh, uh, as you well, very well know, now, I mean, history is not a straight line. I mean, it's, uh, it's a very complex uh, uh, coming and going. It's, uh, history is not simple. History is very, very complex because uh, it has been made of very, very different uh, influences and ways of thinking, ways of viewing, uh, religion, uh, many things, many things. It's not, it's not, a, it's not just a line. It's, but, a, it's but, a very complex mess of uh, things. But as, but as we know, I mean, painters are able sometimes to capture something in the history, That's which, right. you know, simply a photograph would not do. I mean, I would take Manet's painting of the execution of Maximilian a long time ahead of a photograph of the same. That's it. That's right. And, and I think that's one of the very important points of the exhibition of, uh, of uh, Drexel, in, in the sense of that, that he is uh, putting in front of the viewer the things that he has found that are the important, that they are the kind of a keys of the history he's finding in front of him. Uh, I, I think that's part of the, the, the very uh, relevant to me, but it belongs to you. <laughs> yeah, I think, and it's, I, I'm very pleased in the way that you say you feel it's a kind of respectful as well from the outside, because I think that I think for me very importantly in the in embodied in the title was you know this idea of saying this is not definitive. This is not a definitive version. This is not. It's not me saying this is the history of Mexico. Not, I'm not, I'm not saying that to be humble, but it's this idea that really saying that that is, that is the separation, is that, that that is someone coming from outside always has a different eye and a different viewpoint on it, which enriches possibly, hopefully. I'm very pleased that on the whole, it seems to have been taken like that rather than a claim, you know, I'm painting 500 years of Mexican history, which I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you very sure. much. Thank, thank you. Much. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Well, Sorry. Take care. Bye bye. Yeah, Goodbye. Bye bye. 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 Gobierno de México.